Welcome to this special workflow edition of Dave's Tech Table, where we're going to review how to use Encore CS6 and Premiere Pro CC or Premiere Pro Creative Cloud. Remember, as a Creative Cloud subscriber, you have full access to those CS6 applications. So it's as simple as just downloading Premiere Pro CS6, installing that. I myself, I just go ahead and uninstall Premiere and uncheck Encore so it leaves Encore, and then I just use Encore. Uh, CS6 and Premiere Pro CC and it works great. So this workflow is going to go over the rules and sort of the things that I look for on how to burn a successful DVD or Blu-ray. In addition to that, I've been working with engineering on a way to give us an interactive experience on devices like uh, iPhones or Apple TVs or iPads and other portable devices where we can use chapter markers and poster frames from Premiere Pro to create this interactive experience and it works great. So I'll show you how to do that as well. Let's jump over to the tech table and check it out. Okay, so let's take a look at this project and start putting in some key chapter markers, which is really the first thing you, uh, you want to do. Now, for me, on a project of this size, which happens to be three and a half hours in size, I do chapter markers as I go along. So let's take a look at that. First of all, you'll notice in Premiere Pro CC that we no longer have the icon for an, an Encore chapter marker. That's because we've unified the chapter markers into one add marker icon. So I'm going to go ahead and add a marker. And the first thing you'll notice is that the marker here is uh, is green. So that's a little different uh, than you might be used to. And that's what we call a comment marker. We have a couple different types of markers. They're kind of colored markers now. So if I double click on there, you'll notice that I've got uh, a similar dialog box that you've seen before. I'm going to turn it into a chapter marker. And then I'll just come up here and I'll just add some text. And I'll click OK. So it's very important that you add the name because that's what's going to be picked up either by QuickTime when I show you how to output for um, say Apple TV or iPad or iPhone something like that or Blu-ray or DVD so we want to make sure that we have a name to stick to and we don't have a blank area it makes it a lot nicer so I'm going to go ahead and click OK and you'll see that it's a red icon and if I hover my mouse over that it will actually give me the uh, the name and the time code which is really really handy so let me go ahead and just hit slash key which is the fit the timeline to, to the current window. And you'll notice that I've got about 50 or so at a roughly a three and a half hour timeline. So this project came, uh, came along really, really nicely and it's time to output it. So I'll show you how to do a couple different outputs and then get right back into the Encore workflow. Just while I'm here, I wanna go ahead and show you how to output this a couple different ways. Go to media, just like I normally do. And if I wanna go ahead and output this, say for Apple TV, iPhone, or things like that, at this point in time, you just pick uh, QuickTime. QuickTime's actually gonna pick up all that chapter marker uh, information, uh, which is really cool. And I'm gonna go down here and I can choose um, a couple of different things. For me, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure this is a 720-1280 project. Uh, I happen to know a lot of my media happens to be 720. It's a mixed timeline. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose that. That'll also help me uh, on my file size um, a little bit. Uh, I happen to like my quality slider for QuickTime up a little bit, but down at the bottom is a data rate. And for me, uh, I played with this enough with this particular project project that I happen to know that about 5,500 is a pretty good setting and it actually helps me get the size of this three and a half hour project down. Um, it says it's about eight gig down here. It's actually not that high. It's, it's more closer to 4.7 right around there and I'll show you that when uh, when I bring it up again. And then at this point I can queue it over to Media Encoder or go ahead and hit uh, hit export. I'm gonna go ahead and queue it over to Media Encoder. So let me come over here and I'm gonna call this uh, Master Timeline uh, iPad. And I'll say save. And then let me queue that up. Let me go ahead and go back over to, uh, to Premiere. Now what Premiere is doing if you're new here is it's actually sending that entire timeline over to uh, media encoder and again it's a three and a half hour timeline and it has to check in all that media i do get a lot of questions on people wanting to know what it's doing there so the next thing is let's go ahead and export this for blu-ray and let me point out a couple of quick things about uh, general rules and and things to know about blu-ray if your project is 
over 90 minutes. This is just typical rule of thumb in my experience. I've been doing this a long time. I'd use H.264 for Blu-ray to help me get that on a 25 gig disc if those are the discs that I happen to be using. Again, you can get a 50 gig disc these days and I use a lot of those, but they're a bit more expensive. When you wanna choose projects under 90 minutes, general rule of thumb is you can choose MPEG-2, which those files are quite a bit larger than H.264. Then you can choose MPEG-2 Blu-ray. So look at the difference. If I choose MPEG-2 Blu-ray, and let me go ahead and just make sure my video dimensions are 720 again, you'll notice down here that it's 46 gigs in size. That's a lot of information if I choose MPEG-2. And you'll notice if I go back over here and I choose H.264, you'll notice that comes down quite a bit. Now, I also happen to know that when I choose 720, it comes down quite a bit again. And I find that for a lot of projects, just depending on what you're working on, even some of the home video projects, uh, take a look at the difference between 1080 and 720. And again, it depends on whether or not you're trying to fit it on a 25 gig disc and how long the, the, uh, the projects is. If your project's only under two hours or right around there, 25 gig disc will probably work fine. This one, here I could tweak a little bit with the knobs and switches as I call them down here there's lots of different settings that you can go and adjust down here I typically tell people don't adjust any of these our engineers have gone in here and done a lot of testing to analyze the video to make sure things are just right you can go in and noodle around with those if you want but typically I tell people to leave them alone especially if they're new let's just go ahead and get a disc that works once you start playing around with it you can end up especially with these level switches here you can end up with a non-playable blu-ray which may play on a ps3 for example but not on other blu-ray players so there's a lot of things about blu-ray that get to be very finicky so the other thing you'll notice if you choose mpeg 2 for blu-ray and let's go down and choose 720 again and if i go down here you'll notice there's switches down here that a lot of people tend to move these especially if their disc is in a smaller size they typically move these all the way to the right which is not a good idea this is a, a kind of a chemistry set, if you will. And I just warn people, if you're new to this, leave those alone and just let the encoder and Premiere do what it knows how to do and make a really high quality disc. Again, you can always choose to do that. And by the way, this setting here, use a maximum render quality. That's more for a 10-bit setting. You don't really want to check that. Uh, the same thing goes with uh, this one here, variable bit rate uh, double pass. And a lot of times it won't make any difference. It just takes a long time to encode. Feel free to play around with those in some instances it will make a difference but in general encoding uh, i tell people to uh, to leave those alone let's go ahead and put this to h264 and i'm going to go to my master timeline and i've already created a bdr folder here and i'm going to call this bdr just so i know it's my blu-ray and i'm going to go i send that over to media encoder so now i've got two give that a chance to send over that timeline. Again, it's going to be sending over the entire timeline uh, information. Now, the next step is going to be to export mine for a DVD. H.264 for a 2 DVD right here. So MPEG-2 DVD. And again, let's go down and... Uh, double check our uh, our sizes here watching out not to touch a lot of those those presets here so that all looks okay to me you can also look up here this project i want to go ahead and do is a wide setting here and you'll notice that it went ahead and took those black bars around that's going to look okay this is giving me an estimated file size of about nine again being a three and a half hour uh, project i happen to know that that's going to be in the lower eight gigabyte range so i'm going to use a dual dvd to support that that should fit just uh just fine for me and again i got to go up here and change this i'm going to pop out to a folder that i named dvd and change this to dvd and send that over to media encoder and hit play button to start the queue Let's jump out to the desktop and see what we actually created. So the first thing I see is I see the QuickTime movie that I created. Remember, I can use this for Apple TV, you know, iPad, iPhone, uh, any of those types of devices that can play MPEG-4 video. I'm going to right mouse click and I'll open it up. Uh, on the Mac, you have a version of QuickTime called QuickTime 10. Windows, you're limited to QuickTime 7 right now. So let me just jump out and I'll show you the difference. So with QuickTime 10, one of the things you'll notice that we now do is we create poster frames which just really look great. So I've got all my chapter names coming in from Premiere. Again, there's like 50 or so of those things. And the quality looks great in this particular mode. And any of this is gonna look great. I'll play a few seconds of one for you and give you an idea what it looks like when it plays. 
So you get the idea. So, you know, the video quality looks great. Again, chapter marks jumping around really looks fantastic. Now, the difference that you might see on Windows, if I'm going to double click on this, which it will default to QuickTime 7, you'll notice that the poster frames don't show up. So depending on what player you use to play this, you might, in fact, just get chapter names. So I just wanted to give you guys uh, an opportunity to uh, see the difference and also I do happen to see that I must have a chapter marker with no name here and one here and I actually did that on purpose so I wanted to show you guys what happens when you don't put a name in depending on the player you might not get a way to navigate that I use those features a lot now in the blu-ray folder that was the BDR folder what you'll notice is I have a wave file and an mp4 file and of course a chapter markers file here that's all my data coming in to tell me about my chapters and the same thing goes for DVD, and this is the information that Encore is going to use. So I've got an M2V file, which is an MPEG-2 file, a WAV file that matches that, and then an XMP file, which again is my chapter data. Okay, let's jump right into Encore. I'm going to go ahead and click New Project. And I'll start with a Blu-ray, so I'll just name it uh, BDR. Click on Blu-ray. These settings you don't have to worry with so much right now because uh, it, we've already encoded the video, so it should be ready to go. The fastest way to bring in the audio and the video clip is to go ahead and import it as a timeline. And I see that I've got them right here, so I can go ahead and just stretch this out, take a look at this. Here's my audio, here's my video. If I just select those, don't worry about the uh, chapter marker one. It's grayed out on purpose because it knows that it's tied to the video. And I'll go ahead and click open. And the first thing you'll notice is I've got a new timeline here. Again, that's why we go ahead and import as timeline because it names it uh, automatically for us the same name as the video. And all of those chapter markers came over from uh, Premiere. Now, speaking of chapter markers, I'll show you something real quick that a lot of people ask me about, which is creating poster frames. And zoom in. And the first thing you'll notice is I've got a chapter marker number 46. And if I want to change the chapter marker from where it is now, I'd like to have a poster frame that actually gives me, or a thumbnail in this case on the DVD, that actually gives me a better idea of what that chapter is about. Maybe I just want to go ahead and make this the chapter point. So all I have to do is right mouse click and set as poster frame. And you'll notice what it does is it made this little square icon down here. This is the actual one this is the poster frame just a little thing uh, that I like to point out because I do get a lot of questions on that your next step is to go ahead and complete your menu so I'm going to do that and I'll come right back okay go ahead and set that end action a couple different ways to do that either use the pick whip or you can just use the arrow over here click on it and I'm going to go ahead and put it on uh, passport menu 3 uh, default and that just assign that end action that means when this stops It'll go ahead and put it on the uppermost menu. The other thing you want to look at is this icon right over here. Since that was the first thing I created, my timeline, this icon up here is indicating first play. That's the little playhead that's there. And I actually want my menu to play first. So I'm going to go ahead and say set that as first play. So from here, uh, let's go ahead and see what happens when I go to the build menu and I check my project for any sort of errors. And check project and click start. And a number of things are going to come up here. It's telling me the title remote's not set and the menu remote's not set. These have to do with the buttons that are on your remote control, that what happens when you push the menu button on your remote control, where do you want Encore to go? So that's a pretty important setting just in navigation. It makes the experience better. All you have to do is just click on the gray area here and tell it that the title button that's here, what I want it to do is just go to that Passport Menu HD3 and I'll click Default. Go back up to the timeline here and click your menu remote and tell it that when you hit that, you wanna go ahead and have it go to the uppermost menu. You might want it to go to another menu that may be a few steps beneath that if it's a better navigation for you. So now we go back to the build and we click check project again and see if we have any errors. 
and we don't that looks pretty good to me so I'm going to click close now comes the most critical step for making a blu-ray and I'll try to explain this as best I can go ahead and switch the format over to blu-ray a lot of people will create a blu-ray folder um, the worst thing you can do in my opinion is create a blu-ray disc right away the main reason it's not a good idea is because if there's anything wrong with the project maybe there's something wrong with the cache file something got corrupt or you have a bad disk for example a bad burn so what happens is Encore has to build all the way through the whole process and actually build an image then burn the disk so when it burns the disk if there's any problems between the handoff from the building to the burning it gets to be kind of hard to figure out where the issue might be so I highly recommend especially for people that are new to this always create a blu-ray image it'll give you a much better idea if there's any issues if it can't get through building the image then you know there might be a problem with one of your asset for example uh, typically I find this to be fairly bulletproof you're not saving any disk space by not creating an image Encore has to use that image anyway the only difference is when you burn a disk directly from here is it'll delete the image for you automatically again the problem is if you put it on blu-ray disk and it goes through the build process then the what you're going to run into if it fails it has to build it all over again so this way if you just create an image file and it completes that and you have a fail on the burn side you know bad media which is a common problem with blu-ray or something wrong with the firmware on your blu-ray uh, burner this way you don't have to go through the build process it's fairly painless and fairly quick now the other thing you see here is it's telling me that 25.9 gigs have been used and I don't have a choice but to use 50 gigs dual layer uh, blu-ray and you would you'd see the same thing for DVD this is the same process for um, for DVD so at this point I can go and build that project once I tell it where I want it to go so I'm gonna browse for the location I'll put it here click Save and then click on build that'll take it a while depending on the speed of your computer so I'll come back in just a second as you can see here, I've got my Blu-ray ISO sitting right here. It's a 25 gig ISO. Now, all I have to do is use any burning application that I want to to go ahead and burn this, so long as it supports Blu-ray in this case, or DVD if you're using DVD. Windows 7 and 8 can actually burn uh, ISO disk. Macintosh can burn ISO disk as well. I highly suggest using a utility as it monitors it a little bit better. Windows users, there's a great application called ImageBurn that a lot of people use. Um, however, you can actually use Encore to burn any ISO as well. It's so my output now is going to switch over to Blu-ray disk and I can burn from disk image. Browse for that image. Here's my ISO. Click open and I'm ready to go. Pop in a Blu-ray disk or a DVD if you're going that route and then click build. The process is exactly the same. The steps are the same if you want to build a DVD. And that's a quick look at how to use Premiere Pro, CC, and Encore CS6.